It all started when Neil Peart, Rush drummer and lyricist, died in 2020. I've been a Rush fan since I was 15 years old, but over the last decade or so, the legendary Canadian trio hadn't been in my listening rotation very much. Neil's passing was a bittersweet reminder of how much I used to love Rush, and it got me listening again. Really digging into their entire body of work, and it's pretty much all I've been playing over the past two years. Something about the whole experience has left me feeling very nostalgic about music lately. As I spun up old albums that were recorded when I was just a kid, I kept feeling more and more inclined to consume music like I once did. Physical media, analog technology, dedicated stereo components, speakers the size of small refrigerators, the works. Don't get me wrong, millions of tracks at your fingertips courtesy of a mini supercomputer in your pants pocket is something that 15 year old me would have drooled over. I'm not much of a music subscription person, but my entire collection is digitized, hosted on my own Plex server, and accessible on my phone, car, computer, whatever. It's great. But at the same time, I just haven't been able to shake this vision of me popping a CD out of a case and sliding it into a CD player sandwiched between a tape deck and a receiver. I miss listening to music as an activity. Have you ever done that? When I was in my teens and early 20s, I would put a tape or CD into my stereo, sit down in front of it and just sit there, listening. Sometimes I would leaf through the album insert looking at the pictures or reading the lyrics, but otherwise I wouldn't do anything other than just enjoy the music. I realize I haven't done that in like 20 years. These days music is always in the background while I'm doing something else, whether it's working, driving, doing housework, whatever. Between Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, LTE, 5G, smart speakers, and a bazillion songs for like five bucks a month, it's like today's technology says, don't just sit there, dummy, you can play music anywhere. Well, no more. I know it's a little silly, and I know I probably won't end up using it as much as I think I will, but today is the day I source, buy, build, and enjoy an old school stereo system. Now, I'm not looking to spend a bunch of money, just a few hundred bucks. And if you know anything about the vintage stereo equipment market these days, let's just say it's expensive. I don't know if it's always been like this or if it's a recent trend, but the prices on anything with an analog dial display or doodad is bananas. I could easily drop 300 bucks on just a receiver and then some. So let's examine the word vintage for a second. For most of us, that word brings to mind groovy images from the 60s and 70s man. But what exactly is the definition of vintage? When it comes to describing the age of items, the word antique, vintage, and retro are often tossed around. After doing some quick research, I found one definition of vintage describing the term should not be used in reference to objects less than 20 years old. Some people claim vintage audio equals anything manufactured before 1980. Some folks argue that vintage is simply something old. But what exactly is considered old? What if the manufacturer isn't selling a particular item anymore? Does that make it vintage? When it comes to defining vintage audio equipment, there doesn't seem to be a rule set in stone, but something older than 20 years seems to qualify, in my humble opinion. At the time of this recording, 20 years ago was 2002, which definitely doesn't feel very vintage to me, but I guess it's a matter of perspective. I mean, when I was a sophomore in high school, 20 years ago was 1970, which at that time felt vintage -y as vintage can get. The bottom line is, I'm not about to blow a fortune on a receiver that was made before I was born, so it looks like my project is going to focus on stereo gear that was sold at the turn of the 21st century. I'd like to think that Neil would approve. The heart of any good stereo is the receiver, so that's where my hunt began at my old friend shopgoodwill.com. I'm sure you're familiar with Goodwill, but not everyone knows they have an online auction site. The prices are a lot more reasonable than eBay for electronics, but be prepared for cleaning and minor repairs. I placed a bid on a Sony STR-DE845 listed for $6.99. Yep, you heard that price right. According to soundandvision.com, this receiver was unveiled in the summer of 1999 and went on sale in late 2000 or early 2001 as far as I can tell. The user manual is dated from 2000. Sound and Vision listed the MSRP at $480. Adjusted for inflation, that's around $870 in today's dollars. 
Crutchfield says, Bring state-of-the-art digital cinema home with this feature-packed Sony powerhouse. A 24-bit processor gives you super-precise Dolby Digital and DTS decoding. A separate 32-bit processor handles Sony's exclusive digital cinema sound. Sound field circuitry based on acoustic measurements made at Sony Picture Studios movie production stages. Ugh, it goes on. You'll hear movie soundtracks the way the producers and directors intended. With 100 watts per channel, the STRD845 renders your sources with clarity, realism, and impact. You also get Dolby Pro Logic decoding for multi-channel surround sound from sources like a Hi-Fi VCR or Stereo TV. I chose this. Uh, <clears throat> oh, sorry about that. I chose this receiver mostly for the wide variety of input options, especially digital optical. And even though I'm not planning on adding a subwoofer, a port for that is a nice bonus. I'm only planning on stereo sound for music, but the home theater capabilities this receiver provides might come in handy down the road. Just a little coating of sticky dust on the inside after blasting it with air. I didn't want to accidentally knock loose any capacitors or wire connections, so I left well enough alone. The receiver was missing the remote control and radio antennas, and I had to clean it up just a little, but it's still in great shape and works flawlessly. It has way more options than I'll ever need, but it's nice to know they're there. With shipping, handling, and tax, the Sony sent me back $18.32. With the receiver cleaned up and powered up, I had no way of testing the sound since I don't have any speakers in the house. Finding the right speakers for this project was going to be a challenge. More on that later, but in the meantime, I popped into one of my local thrift stores and found a small pair of bookshelf units I could use for testing. These speakers were once included with a Lennox Sound SL356 CD audio system. As chance would have it, the manual is dated from the year 2000, so I lucked out with a period-appropriate pair of speakers without even realizing it until I got home. They were priced at $5.15 each, and I actually liked the way they look. I figured I could hang on to them to use as rear speakers if I ever wanted to use the receiver for home theater surround sound. I don't have any components to attach yet, and the tuner couldn't pick up any radio stations without an antenna, but the static sounded... good. Bottom line is, the receiver works and it puts out sound. Neat! With the test speakers tested, that brings the project total so far to $29.32. Back to the subject of speakers. Goodwill offered plenty of choices, but anything larger than a bookshelf speaker was pickup from the store only for obvious reasons. For this system, I really wanted some decent sized floor speakers, but I also didn't want to pay a fortune for shipping. That excludes already pricey eBay again, so I started looking at Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist to see what was for sale in the area. I was curious to see what the new speaker landscape is like these days, and I wasn't too surprised to find that speakers are still a very expensive item. The cheapest floor speaker at my local Best Buy were around 250 bucks each, and really the only option I could afford from Amazon were these Dayton Audios listed for $150 a pair. That's cheap for a pair of speakers, but it's still way more than what I want to spend. Not to mention, the whole goal of this project is to build a vintage system, speakers included. Hmm, I may have to bite the bullet and buy those Dayton audios if I can't find anything else. But it's not really sitting quite right with me. Let's keep looking. In the meantime, my lonely receiver needed a CD player, so that's what I started working on next. I hadn't planned on buying the same brand components for my whole system, but when I found this Sony 5-disc changer, everything fell into place. It was from the same generation as my receiver, so the styling is very similar. It had digital optical out, which is a must for me. I had my heart set on a single disc system, just because that's what I had back in the day, but I started appreciating the ability to handle five CDs at once almost immediately. The Sony CDP-CE245 has the year 2000 listed in the user manual. Crutchfield says, This affordable five-disc carousel is long on beautiful sound and conveniences. Disc exchange lets you change four discs while the fifth keeps playing so your music never has to stop. To locate a song, just spin the front panel jog dial or choose shuffle play for a surprise mix. The optical digital output lets you make crystal clear direct digital recordings to mini disc. And making custom cassette recordings from your CDs is also easy thanks to time edit, peak search, and fade. It offers 32-track programming, random and repeat play, and a 1-bit DA converter, whatever that is.
When Crutchfield sold this player knew it was listed for $129.95. Like my receiver, it was missing the remote, but also like my receiver, it's in great shape and works flawlessly. $20 was my winning bid on the CD player, plus $17.14 for shipping and handling. That brings the grand total so far to $66.46. Great news on the speaker front. I hopped on Craigslist and found some speakers listed earlier that day in my area, about a 30-minute drive away. And wouldn't you know it, they were Sony's. The user manual for the Sony SSMF 650H speakers is dated from 2003. They sport two 6.5 inch woofers, a 3 inch mid range driver, and a 1 inch balanced dome type tweeter. They can handle up to 180 watts, have a rated impedance of 8 ohms, and a sensitivity level of 89 decibels. Frequency range from 40 to 50,000 hertz. They were first available on Amazon in 2004, and a reviewer there said they paid $120 in 2006. I'm not sure if that's for the pair or each, but I'm assuming it was $120 each. According to my Craigslist seller, they are highly rated. All jokes aside, these speakers are awesome. The price was great, and they still look brand new. I'm no audiophile, but I think they sound good. Really good. They're the perfect size, and if you ask me, they look pretty badass to boot. I paid the full asking price of 75 bucks for the Sony speakers. That brings the grand total so far to $141.46. Now that I knew the size of my speakers, I could finally go ahead with finding a good home for my new system. Most home entertainment furniture on the market these days are designed for sound bars and massive modern TVs, not stereo rack systems. In order to get exactly what I was looking for, I decided to design and build my own entertainment stand. Since this isn't a woodworking video, I won't bore you with the details, but it wasn't too complicated. A few 1x10 pine boards, some glue, screws, and stain, and I was done. Looks pretty good if I do say so myself. Despite the fact I only have one cassette in the house, the next component I focused on was a tape deck. While I didn't have any bidding challenges with the receiver and CD player, I was outbid on two decks I originally had my eye on. This didn't surprise me too much since the crazy prices on true vintage gear I mentioned at the top of the video definitely bleeds over into the world of tapes. By this point I was looking at Sony components exclusively and I finally lucked out on a TCWR535. Released in 1993, it's the oldest component in my system but visually it fits right in. It sports the same style and colored Sony fonts and the same sleek black case. The only difference is the lack of a tapered edge at the top of the front plate, but I doubt anyone would ever notice that but me. The WR535 features 4-track, 2-channel stereo, auto-reverse, and Dolby noise reduction. Definitely more highfalutin than any tape player I ever had in my youth. The only problem I ran into is it didn't work. An unhealthy noise greeted me when I tested with my one and only tape. I removed the cover to find that both belts had broken, not very surprising considering the original belts would have been almost 30 years old. Goodwill clearly stated that their testing consisted of powering the unit on but nothing else, so I was disappointed but not angry or anything. Installing new belts isn't a very difficult job, but not a cheap one considering a replacement kit costs around 30 bucks, essentially a Ziploc bag containing four rubber bands. I had planned on going through the repair process for this video, but uh, I just can't motivate myself to get it done. Maybe if I actually had some tapes to play, I would want to tackle this job, but I just don't feel like it. At some point, I will fix this deck and probably put it in another video, but for now, I'm happy with the aesthetic value of a third component on my shelf. I know it's lame, but I never claim to be not lame. I outbid the other Goodwill nerds for $18 plus $10.27 shipping and handling. The grand total, $169.73.
I've never been much of a radio person, but I figured I would buy replacement AM and FM antennas, antennae. I found this rather unremarkable pair from Bing Fu on Amazon and plugged them in. Yeah, I'm not very exciting. With all the major components ticked off my list, it was time to turn my focus from the past to the present. With over 4,000 tracks in my music library, all of this would be a waste if I couldn't enjoy them on my new stereo. Bluetooth to the rescue. There's a wide variety of Bluetooth receivers on the market to choose from, with prices ranging from under 20 bucks to into the thousands. If you're not familiar with these devices, it's just a Bluetooth adapter that plugs into one of the inputs on the back of your receiver. Pair your phone, tablet, or computer to the device, and you've just given a second life to your old receiver that was built before Bluetooth audio streaming was ever invented. As usual, Amazon had an overwhelming list to choose from, but obviously I wasn't going to drop a grand on one. I kept my search for under 100 bucks, and the only other requirement I had was to once again have optical out connection. Eventually I decided on a 1MII B03 Pro Bluetooth 5.0 transmitter receiver. At 80 bucks, I figured at least it wasn't cheap garbage, and this model boasts a built-in ESS Sabre DAC, which according to the listing is recognized by audiophiles as the gold standard when it comes to digital to analog converters. It arrived the same day as an original remote control for my receiver, which I found on eBay. I mostly bought it so I didn't have to get out of my chair to adjust the volume like some loser, but also because of the cool factor. I mean, look at this thing. So how is the budget looking now? $12.99 for the antenna combo, $79.99 for the most expensive item, the Bluetooth receiver, and $32.69 for the remote control. A little pricey, but I think that one is worth it. That leaves the grand total sitting at just under 300 bucks. One nice thing about the Bluetooth adapter is its ability to easily handle two sources. That means I can connect my phone and move about the house or use an old tablet I had lying around as a dedicated player that lives in the stereo cabinet. Using the Plex Amp app, I can easily play any song from my Plex server library. With the visualization going on the screen, it's a pretty cool addition to the whole setup. I was a little worried because this tablet is from 2016 and it isn't using the latest Bluetooth version, but after a couple of tests, I found it sounds just as good as my phone when playing Plexan. And what about the quality of the Bluetooth receiver with its highfalutin DAC? I'm pleased to say it sounds really good. Audiophile snobs turn their noses up at lossy Bluetooth, but I did a couple of comparisons playing one of my Rush CDs, immediately followed by the same song on my tablet. I really couldn't tell the difference at all. So there you have it. I can't begin to tell you how much I am loving this stereo. At the beginning of this video I implied that most of the fun would be sourcing and putting together this project, and I probably wouldn't use the stereo as much as I thought. Wrong! I've got this baby playing almost every day, whether it's listening to NPR in the back room while I'm working, blasting away while I'm cleaning the house, or sitting there just listening to some tunes. That's right, just like the old days, I've been sliding in a CD, cracking a beer, and just sitting in my chair, enjoying the music while gazing at my beautiful Sony friend. I hope I inspired you to ditch that tacky speaker with the flashing LED lights or the overpriced headphones and start building a vintage system of your own. As you can see, it's possible to build a kick-ass rig for just a few hundred bucks if you take your time and shop wisely. I certainly could have spent less by leaving out the tape deck that I'll probably never use and skipping the remote control. Another place to save is dropping the CD player and going strictly Bluetooth. Dropping the radio option and sticking with the virtually unlimited listening options through my Bluetooth receiver, I'd still get the same great sound for $173.31. Not too bad. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.